Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Let's open uh, this next segment with a word of prayer. Glorious one, we honor you. Uh, we come boldly to the throne of grace today to seek you out. We ask for forgiveness of sins committed knowingly and unknowingly. And we say, Lord, have your way in our fellowship today. Have your way in the sanctuary today. Have your way in our hearts and minds today. We're trusting and believing you, Lord, for utterance, for words to speak. I pray, Lord, that you will quicken me as I speak. I pray that you will quicken us and edify us, Lord God, Father, as we hear and as we listen. Manifest yourself strong in this place today. Be glorified and may no man, may no flesh glory in your presence. We give you all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, if my voice is a little hoarse today, do forgive me. The Lord is at work in my body. Um, I want us to pick up from Second Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to cut straight in. We've been talking about um, the way of the righteous. We've been talking about the way of the righteous. I believe we are at episode 7 today, part 7. And we are pressing in, pressing in. So all the glory and all the honor. Is it part eight? In fact, part eight. All the glory and all the honor be to our great God. Um, and let's step in. So just turn to me to Second Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, and let's have a little read of what the Paul says. Do we begin again to command, excuse me, to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of condemnation to you or letters of condemnation from you the word says you are our epistle written in our own hearts known and read of all men known and read of all men verse 3 says for as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of christ ministered by us hallelujah written not with ink but with the spirit of the living god not in tables of stone but in fleshly in what fleshly this is very important tables of the heart for says and such trust have we through christ to god ward may the lord bless his holy word uh, I, we spoke at some length um, last time we were together and I um, wanted us to understand that there is action. Faith comes by um, hearing and hearing the word of God. However, the scripture tells us very clearly that um, faith without works, where there is faith but no works exist, the faith that we see, the faith that is evidenced is a dead faith. We are aware of what a living body looks like it moves it breathes it exists and it's powerful and the one who is no more one whose spirit and soul have left their physical body is but a shell of their former self if you've ever seen um, a corpse you understand this and i want you to understand that it's it is possible to to have faith that is a corpse the scripture is explicit in this it is a dead faith it is a faith that is inactive it may have the image or the resemblance of one that lives one that exists one that breathes but in actuality there is no power there is no efficacy there is no wealth in such faith it bears no fruit and i want us to understand this very clearly as we read here in second corinthians 3 we understand something the apostle is pressing in for us to understand that there is a moving, there is a shifting from what was to what should be, or at that time, what would be. And that is, we move from a place of law that was um, stagnant and that was dead to a law that was written in our hearts that was alive. It was not this kind of relationship where, you know, imagine, imagine a husband and wife and they're, they're relating to each other and every time the husband wants to relate to his wife, he has to quickly run to her and say to her, what do you like again? What don't you like again? He wants to get her a gift for her birthday and he doesn't just know intrinsically, he doesn't know experientially what it was that um, she liked or over the years, they've been together for 20, 30, 50 years 
and he know, does not know. He doesn't have the power to know. He has to run, ask her, and then can go away and do a thing. And I liken that to the old and the new. The old was not alive in our hearts. It was not written in our hearts, although there were some who were able. We read in verse 2, the apostle says, you are our epistle. What is that? It's a letter. He says, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. What is he saying here? I've touched on this ever so slightly as we were together previously, but I want you to understand something. Your faith, the righteous understand that their faith is manifest daily in their lives. The righteous understand that as I'm living out my faith, as I'm living out my Christianity, as I'm living out my relationship with God, it is possible for others to see and to know. We edged forward from here and we landed at Col Colossians um, chapter 3. Let's go back here. Because I, it, I, I, it was not only for me to let you know that God wanted to fellowship with you. The righteous understand that God wants to fellowship with us. The righteous understand that God wants to relate with us. It wasn't only that. It was also that God had empowered us. God had empowered us. And I believe we closed a little further down than this. But let's go back to this for, for the sake of revisiting it. Colossians chapter 3 um, and verse 3. And it says, verse 3 says, for you are dead. It says, for, for you are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. I told you last week about my sister and her amazing pastor parcel packages. Verse 4 says, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. May the Lord bless his holy word. When Christ appears, you appear. And you know what? This is one of those multi-dimensional pieces of scripture because yes, on that fateful day when the master comes, the scripture tells us that those who are dead and in the grave will come and meet him in the sky. Those who are, of us who are here will meet him in the sky. Yet yeah, I want you to understand that today as the master daily makes intercession for you and as you live and exist and breathe here when the spirit of christ comes up in you when this when you are led by the spirit of god christ is being seen and do you know what you are being seen what do what, what do you mean zeke zeke what are you talking about this is what i'm saying you want to go and pray for forgiveness and you don't pray in the name of jesus you don't bank on the covenant of jesus you want to go by um uh, the, the lamb you want the, the bullocks offering or or the, the the old wine offering to go and meet with the lord well the lord doesn't see you he doesn't see you he might see your offering he might acknowledge you for what you are but today if you want to be represented in the courtroom of heaven we have the ability to go there and be seen because we are hidden within Christ. We are hidden with Christ. What am I saying to you? I'm saying to you that the righteous understand. I told you this previously. The righteous understand that it is through Christ their righteousness is fulfilled. It is through Christ their righteousness is fulfilled. We are growing and developing and enriching and refreshing our relationship with God when we move through Christ, when we try to do it in the flesh. I spoke to you about this last time about walking walking faith without works is dead and i brought it forward and said let's not talk about works let's talk about action faith without action is dead faith without action is dead if we do not yield ourselves to christ actively if we've not can made a confession of faith if we're not walking by faith we will not see the fruits of the spirit let's edge forward romans 6 i think is where we closed out romans 6 and 9 let's go to romans 6 and 9 really quickly Welcome, welcome everyone in the house. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online. The Lord bless you richly. Romans 6 and 9. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin. once but in that he lives he lives unto god 11 says likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto god through jesus christ our lord in case you know i didn't really do a good job of expressing this to you a moment ago i want you to understand now <clears throat> what we've read and we've seen here that the apostle explicitly is presenting this reality to us that we might understand that it is through christ we are alive 
It is through Christ we live. It is through Christ we are able. Let's go to verse 12. This is verse 12. It says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Let, let, pause for a minute. Let's pause. Listen. We're going to go. We're going to stop and go. We're going to stop and go. Listen. Righteousness. All right. It's not something you can do by yourself. I said this to you previously. Righteousness is not something you can do by yourself. Listen to the way that he phrases verse 12. All right. I've presented this. The righteous understand that there is a choice to be made. Um, I wanted to revisit some of this today. It may be next week. And I believe that we're really drawing close to closing out on this. We're about a week or two uh, of closing. I thought it would be today, but we're not there yet. And I've presented this choice. We saw Cain and Abel and we will revisit them. Last time we saw Jacob and Esau, and I believe we will revisit them. And I want you to understand that in it's funny as I was pre- as I was prepping again, going through these examples. You know, the Lord kept bringing up to me this the concept that they were brothers. They were brothers. They were brothers. It's so important. You know why? Because your natural bloodline does not justify your righteousness. It doesn't happen. Do you understand? Cain and Abel were brothers. They were brothers. So one might think, wow, they are both righteous. But it didn't, it didn't turn out that way. Why? Because they had a choice to make. You know what I'm telling you? You have a choice to make. I have a choice to make. We have choices that are given to us by God to make. We have choices to make. 12 says, listen to 12. It says, let not... Let not. What does that imply? Listen, this is a question. Uh, this, is, this is a question. Romans 6, 12. Let not sin. Let not. What is he saying in there? What is he saying? So, but but what, what is it? You remember I spoke to you last week and I said to you, look, with every law, all right, every maxim, every, every principle, the converse is true. All right? So the opposite is true. You know, so... We went through it last week. Like, go back and watch the video from last week. If you're here and you don't remember, go back and watch the video, yeah? If you're online and you weren't here, you didn't get it, go back and watch the video. Listen, so what I'm saying, the opposite is true, but I want you to hone in on something here. He's saying, let not. What is he saying? The implication is that the, the choice is whose? That's right. Let not means the responsibility is yours. The power is yours. The opportunity is yours. God has bestowed that choosing power on you. So those who were like, oh, the sin is just too much. It's overtaking me. There's nothing I can do. Go back and read the verses before this. Because if you understand that you're hidden in Christ, if you understand that as Christ died, you died. As Christ rose, you rose. And as, as death has no hold on Christ, so too death has no hold on you. This is really important. We read this in our exhortation today. You heard the apostle saying, to live is Christ, to die is gain. What does that mean? And he's even, he's even like, well, to die, it's even a better thing is even to die because I'm with Jesus. So he's not running from death. He's embracing death because he understands his position. He's not dying to damnation. He's dying into glory. This is very key for us. Um, 13, he says, so look, you should obey its last thereof. And I can take you straight back to Genesis. We can talk about Cain and the I said the cheat code. God gave us the cheat code from the, the opening of the book. I like Ken Ham answers in Genesis. Uh, like I've always liked that phrase, you know, because a lot of the answers are there in Genesis. It's there, it's rich, it's true. 13 says, neither yield ye. Neither do what? So what is he saying again? It's your responsibility not to let up. You should not give. He's saying, don't give. You don't give. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves. But do what? Yield yourselves. So is your mum and dad yielding for you? Is your husband yielding for you? Is your wife yielding for you? Who's yielding? Understand that. Yield yourselves unto who? Unto God. As those that are, listen, alive from the dead. This is very important. If you're alive... You understand you have power. I go back to what I said about faith a moment ago. Faith without works is dead. You can't say you've got faith and it's not active, it's not moving, it's not alive. The evidence of your faith, the Bible says faith is, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
your the invisible things become evidenced as we begin to walk faith out. And he's saying, look, if you're alive, if you, the righteous understand that they are alive and they are empowered by God. We've got, I'm, like, I'm, I'm preaching to the end before we even get, I'm preaching to you guys next week, you know. He's saying to us that if you're alive, you know what you should do? Live like you're alive. What did the apostle say? He says, you know, when I was a boy, similar principle, when I was a boy, I acted like a boy, I acted like a child. But as I, as I became a man, I had to, listen to what he said, I had to put away the childish things. This is very important for us as those who are acknowledging. You know, maturity is not about your biology. It's not just about the fact that you grow and you mature, like um, adults, children go through puberty and they grow. It's not about that. You might be, you know, a few, yeah, like, you know, a couple centimeters when you start. Then you're a couple feet. Then some of us go to, uh, you know, <laughs> we go taller. But it's not just about your height. It's not just about that. It's about your spiritual maturity. People think, oh, I'm so smart. I'm so intellectually bright. I've read all of these books. I've gone to these courses. I've got all of these accolades. The problem is spiritually they're dead. They operate in spiritual death. It's a problem. Do you know why? Because as a member of the kingdom of God, we have overcome death. Back to 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of what? Unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those. Thank you, Lord. He says, yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Do you understand that your righteousness or unrighteousness is demonstrated by your choice to act? I want you to follow me, right? I said your righteousness or unrighteousness is demonstrated. I didn't say you acquire. I didn't say the acquisition of righteousness is you going out living as righteous. That is salvation. We're not talking about that. It's salvation that makes you a saint. It's salvation that brings you in. It's the shed blood of Christ that makes you righteous. Yet you are called as a mature one. And when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the example. So, you know, parents, we had a great, had a great conversation yesterday with my good, good friend. And, um, we were talking about teaching children. And you know, it's really important for us to understand that <coughs> there is a necessity for young boys to be taught how to live as men. There is a necessity for young women, young girls, to be taught how to live as women. And the issue is, if there is no instruction, it's a free-for-all. It's a free for all. And we're going to come to this. I said, I'm preaching the end. As the spirit leads, I just allow the Lord to flow. <clears throat> but God is so good to us, to us that he has established within his word, within our walk, within our journey, the ability for us to understand what righteousness looks like. Do you know what I'm talking about? So just as a mother trains a young girl in what a woman looks like, the young lady can see her mum, can observe her mum, can watch her mum, they hear her mum. The young boy sees his dad, watches his dad, observes his dad. Those are facets. Then you have the instructive. There's observ observation, obs observative, obs uh, the observation and the instruction. Now you begin to instruct them. And this is what God has done for us. God has enabled us to see clearly, but not just to see, to understand and to have explained to us the necessities, the characteristics, the traits of righteousness. You choose. You choose if your members will be members of righteousness or members of unrighteousness. And I know I'm playing with some people's doctrine right now. Some <clears throat> one group right now is rolling over, fighting right now, saying, no, 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 that's not right. But this is it. This is the scripture. I didn't write this. And by the spirit of the Lord, we'll get clarity on this. <clears throat> He says, 15, <coughs> let's go 14 quickly. First, okay, thank you. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. You are not under the law, but under grace. 15 says, what then shall, what then? Shall we sin? 
because we are not under the law but under grace god forbid and he's blatantly telling us there that you have a choice you could do wrong you can't like you could willingly go out and sin but he's saying it's like god forbid <sighs> listen how else can i express this 16 he says know ye not you know those of you that know me know this is one of my all-time favorite verses i love them all he says know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servant to obey his servants you are to whom you obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto what thank you 17 but god be thanked that you were the servants of sin but you have obeyed do you hear what he said He's talking in the past tense. You've already obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. They're saved now. They're in the kingdom now. 18, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. May the Lord bless his holy word. <clears throat> and I want you to hone in on to verse 16. Verse 16 is telling us this. This is what he's saying to us. He's saying, just in the, in the very same way that you look through a newspaper. It's online now. Sorry, that was that was back in the day you look online <clears throat> at the job board and you're like mm, i think i fancy this job and that job and that job you look at the job description and you apply it, it works the same way you have to see the fruits of the spirit you have to see the works of the flesh and he says what to whom you yield yourself servant to obey do you know when you apply for a job and they say yes we'll have you you sign that contract and you walk in. Do you know what you're doing? You're yielding yourself a servant to obey. Don't take it offensively. I don't mean it in any disrespect. It's just the reality of life. This is old English. Today we say you've been employed by it. And that's what it is. You've chosen to be employed by said employer. I've got a good friend. He says to me that, you know, sometimes people get misconstrued. They sit down in an interview and they think that the company is interviewing them. He's the one that told me. He said, no, when we sit down, we're interviewing the company. Said so at the end of the interview, they ask you, oh, so is there any questions for me? Then you pull out your notebook. So what's the company culture like? Oh, so how flexible are you guys on holiday? Now it's in the COVID season. Oh, so how are you on working from home? Oh, so do you have family on child day? Like that's your opportunity to inquire about because many people are living in that, operating in that air of desperation. Oh, I got a job interview. This is it. I'm going in. And it's like they, they take jobs based on the fact that the job arrived, not because they believe there's abundance and they can have many jobs. If, you, if I'm ever talking to someone, I'm always telling them, look, don't worry about this one job. Your job will come. Evaluate the place and ensure it's where you want to be. Evaluate the situation. It's very important. So we are in control of who we choose to be employed by. Someone said, hold on, blasphemy. What do you mean? I didn't say God didn't create you. I didn't say God, you're not made in the image of God. All of those things are true. And so much so that God wants you to be a mature one and select him over the enemy. Let's go to Genesis 15. <clears throat> Please. Bear with me today. The Spirit of the Lord is at work in my body. <clears throat> We've read this a few times, I believe, during this series. And again, <clears throat> one of my favorite places to reference. Let's just step through because it's important that we understand that, that a covenant was established. There was a covenant that was established. And we see, a, we see this in part here. 15.1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward got questions about all of that and abram said lord god what will you give me seeing i go childless god says to abram i'm going to be your shield and i'm going to be your reward and i said we've spoken about this already if you watch this in the in the episodes leading up to this listen intently what is a shield a shield is a covering and a form of protection what is a reward it is a, a denomination of value that's given in exchange for something good behavior or something to that effect so god is telling abraham i am going to be the thing i he didn't say i'm going to give you a shield he didn't say i'm going to give you a reward and this is very very important he said i am your shield if we can understand this verse here alone 
going back to Abraham in Genesis 15, I, I said this to you like last week, I keep saying the same thing to you, it's, this, is, this is becoming more and more profound. The, um, we understand that something really powerful is happening. We understand that something really powerful is happening. <coughs> I am your shield. <coughs> what does that mean? God himself is covering Abraham from problems. It's not that you've got this almighty shield that we hear about in uh, these funny stories and these funny, you've got this mighty weapon. <laughs> Forget that. God said, <laughs> this is why, you know, idols can't compare with God. You know that? Idols, like demons, they can't compare with God. They all try this to like to mimic stuff. It doesn't work. It does not. But we need to get our mind right. Sarah was talking about mind renewal during the testimony. And this is very important we need to get our minds right i am your shield listen meditate on that during the week he says and your exceeding great reward i love this verse so much he didn't say to abram it's like i'm excited for abram this is what, like i love it because i'm excited that god could say this to abram he said not i'm your reward not i'm your great reward but your exceeding great reward you know what it, you know god understands his value this is really key. God understands his value and was doing his best to convey that while you're engaging with Abraham at this point in time. How did we get here? We're here because in the New Testament, they're talking to us about being hidden in Christ. I don't know if you guys are with me. About being hidden in Christ. Do you know what that means? <laughs> I know the spirit of the living God dwells within us. But when we engage God, God sees the blood shed sacrifice of his only begotten son, Jesus. Do you understand what that means? We are protected on engagement with God by his son. <laughs> I hope I'm making sense. He said, I am your exceeding great reward. I don't know if we're going to touch this until next week or till we get to the end of this, but this is very, very important as well. God is telling him, you may have known rewards before as silver coins, as sheep, as shekels, uh, denarii, whatever it was that there was their means of exchange at that time. I am not a great, I'm not giving you a reward. I'm not giving you a great reward, but I want you to acknowledge that I will be your exceeding great reward. What is God saying? God is trying, this is mind renewal in action. The converting of the soul, we spoke about that two episodes back. God wants Abraham to understand that there is nothing that he can receive of value that is comparable to what God is doing for him right now. His relationship with God is more than the righteous understand this. <laughs> let's just read on because i'm camping too long two abram said lord god what will you give me seeing i go childless abram still <laughs> look listen 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 the steward of my house is Eliezer of damascus three abram said behold to me you have given no seed and lo one born in my house is mine heir for and behold the word of the lord came unto him saying this shall not be your heir but he that shall come forth out of your own bowels shall be your heir and he brought him forth aboard and said, look now towards heaven and tell the stars if you are able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall your seed be. Praise the Lord. Two more verses. Six. And he believed. He did what? In the Lord. And he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the earth of the Chaldees. To give thee this land to inherit it. God's plan for Abraham, well, let me just call him Abraham, was greater than that than he had of himself. It is vital, people of God, that we understand, that we understand as the righteous, that God's plan is greater. Look, I keep saying this as well. I don't mean this in cliche form. You hear this? God has a great plan for your life. It's one thing for it to be said. It's another thing for it to be heard. 
but the power is for it to be believed this is where the power comes for abraham it was counted as righteousness because he believed <clears throat> the righteous understand that the plan and purpose of god is greater than the plan and the purpose of themselves i asked you what was a shield god protected abraham from pharaoh god protected abraham from abimelech and do you know what we are protected i gave you the example just now what is the reward spoils and benefits came from many people from pharaoh from abimelech from lot from the battle that he had with the kings over lot and again we are rewarded today and we'll touch on that either later today or in the weeks to come let's go to romans chapter 9 briefly thank you lord praise your name you can start at verse 6 praise your name holy father i'll try and shift through this quickly it says not as though the word of god has taken none effect um for they are not all israel which are of israel neither because they are the seed of abraham um, all children but in isaac shall your seed be called Remember what i told you earlier on about coming from a single family does not qualify you for righteousness verse 8 says that is they which are the children of the flesh these not the children of god but the children of the promise are counted for the seed <clears throat> excuse me verse 9 for this is the word of promise at this time will i come and sarah shall have a son and not only this but when rebecca also had conceived by one by our father isaac 11 check where we are almost there for the children being not yet born neither having done any good or evil that the purpose of god according to election might stand not of works but of him that calls it was said unto her the elder shall serve the younger as it is written jacob have i loved but esau have i hated what shall we say then uh, unrighteousness with god god forbid let's keep going for he has said to moses i will have mercy on whom i will have mercy and i will have compassion on whom i will have compassion so then it is not of him that wills nor of him that runs but of god that shows mercy hallelujah for the scripture says unto pharaoh even for this same purpose have i raised thee up that i might show my power in thee and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth therefore have have he mercy on whom he will mercy and whom he will he hardens you will say then unto me why doth he yet find fault for who have resisted his will nay but o man who art thou that that repellest against god shall the thing formed say to him that formed why have you made me thus two more verses hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor if god is willing to show wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction i read i said two more i'll just read one more and that he might make known the riches of his glory of the vessels of mercy which he have afore prepared unto glory may the lord bless his holy word people read this year and <clears throat> build a false doctrine around it there's a there's a a really beautiful clue in what we've read here again i'm not going to go into this and break it off i want you to look at verse 12 he said okay we're going to jump two verses so 12 says not by works but by him who calls she was told is that all in the same place yeah is that right she cut up last circle nine and twelve yeah sorry yeah, yeah i'm reading from a different translation so it was said unto her the elder shall serve the younger it was said unto her the elder shall serve the younger okay now jump down with me to verse 22 sorry so 22 listen to what it says it says if god is willing to show wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction so people are like hold on but god makes one person i'm just going to say it plainly 
God makes one person for good and one person for bad. If this is true, how can we be angry with God? <coughs> Listen to what the Amplified says on that same verse. It says, what if God, although willing to show his terrible wrath and to make his power known, has tolerated with great patience. Can you say that with me, please? Great patience. All right. The objects of his wrath, which are prepared for destruction. The complete Jewish Bible says, now, what if God, even though he was quite willing to demonstrate, quite willing to demonstrate his anger and make known his power, patiently put up with. Say that with me, please. Patiently put up with. CEV says, God wanted to show his anger and reveal his power against everyone who deserved to be destroyed. Listen to that phrase, who deserved to be destroyed. But instead, this is very important for you to hone into. Instead, he patiently put up with them. What this is revealing to us is that God has a plan. And for God's plan to be fulfilled, he establishes some players in that plan. However, the wonderful thing about the God we serve is that he extends grace to us. And I challenge you right now, listen to this. The grace that God extends today or our, our God who is gracious today has been gracious since the beginning of time. And you have to read through scriptures to fully appreciate this. I can just give you a prime example to say the scripture says that the lamb was slain before the foundations of the world. I can say to you that if you look at the relationship that the Israelites had with their neighboring countries, God put provisions in for other people to come in. God had been extending grace to the nations, to mankind from the beginning. We spoke about the beginning of this series. Abraham's family, Abraham's family were idol worshippers. Out of idol worship, God picked one. <coughs> I want you to understand this. And we read it just now. Abraham believed. What would have happened if he didn't? That's the question. Would he then fall into the category of those who deserved to be judged? People don't want to realize or look at those things in the true context of what is presented. As I was pondering on this and I was looking at this for sake of an example, I thought about um, a few examples. One of them was the, the slow to discipline parent. You know, there's some of us parents who know, you know, some parents have got a child and it's just like, they'll tell you, this he's a bad boy. He just a bad boy, bad, bad boy. And the child knows how to push the parents' buttons. They're in the supermarket. You shouldn't be calling your child a bad boy, by the way. Let me just put it out there. Um, you're in a supermarket, you're out and about, and the boy or the girl just knows how to push your buttons. They'll be rolling on the floor. On the, imagine you're on a bus and the child just, you know, if you don't want to press the bell, bing, 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 stop doing that, bing, bing, bing. They just play, play, play. And the parent knows that the child is acting unruly, but they constantly give that child the benefit of the doubt. They're constantly extending grace to that child. So, this is, in many ways, the way I see our gracious God. We are observing these things and extending this grace and love to our children because we've seen it somewhere before. They misbehave at school. They misbehave at home, the supermarket, on the bus. There is this, another example is the lenient judge. A court constantly shows leniency or mercy or grace to a continued offender. And it's like, you know, someone comes and they represent him and say, oh, you know, he's of good conduct. He comes from a good family. He, he, that he means well. X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. But still, the judicial system shows grace to this person again and again and again. Many of us, when we really evaluate the, the, the grandeur of some of the sin that's been committed, we couldn't show grace in that manner. But the scripture tells us, <coughs> excuse me, praise the Lord. The scripture tells us that he is gracious. Um, sorry. Oh, <laughs> I'll give you one more example for you, my food. <coughs> there was a, once upon a time I had a dream car. I had a car, I really liked it. It was good. But this car constantly had issues. Thank you. It had issues. I was, I fixed one, paid for this thing, something else come, and I'm just shocked. Like, I'm just like, I, don't, I like you, I like the way you look, I like the way you drive, but you're costing me money. 
what am I really like? Really, I should kick the car to the curb. I should get rid of the car. Since <laughs> Sarah had a way, the car will be gone a long time. Do you understand? But these are the examples I thought of as I was pressing into the scripture and the Lord was just revealing to me. Sometimes we have a thing that means a lot to us. We care for this and we don't want to get rid of it or cast judgment on that thing. It's very important for us to put ourselves in the place of empathy to understand these scenarios. Let's go to Luke chapter 17, please. Verse 1, then said he unto his disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come, but what unto you through whom they come? Let's go forward. It were better for him that a milestone were hang about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Let's go forward. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespassed against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, do what? Forgive him. Verse 4 says, And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, what should you do? Forgive him. Verse 5 tells us, And the apostles said unto the Lord, <laughs> listen to this, increase our faith. Let's ask the Lord to do that for us. Increase our faith. I want you to understand something. When it comes to faith, we are modeling God. God has faith. We are learning. We are the babes. We are the juniors observing the faith of our God. The righteous understand that grace, grace is an expression of our righteousness. Grace. Do you understand that? It's very important that we acknowledge this. And we're going to touch a little further on why and how as we edge forward uh, next time, I believe, because... Yes, we're, we're drawing close on time. But it's important for us to understand this. He says, if your brother, she cut her. Verse 3 says, if your brother trespass, not if a stranger. Yeah, he wasn't talking about someone far away in a faraway land. He said, rebuke him, rebuke him. And then if he repents, forgive him. This was conduct for the home, conduct in the house. Um, God was telling us the way that we are supposed to deal with situations that are close to us. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12, verse 46, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. While he yet talked to the people, behold, what happened? His mother and who? His brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. We're going to touch on this verse a few times for the rest of this series. 47 tells us, Then one said unto him, Behold, your mother and your brethren stand without desiring to speak with you. 48, he replied to him, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? What did he do? What was, what is, what's the first word of verse 49? Stretched forth his hand to who? And what did he say? Here, here are my mother and my brothers. 50 says, I'm sorry, am I reading a modern translation for you guys here? Yeah? 50 says, <laughs> sorry, for whoever, behold, <laughs> does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. This is important. And when you overlap this you overlay Matthew 12 what we just read in Luke 17 I want you to see something I want you to see something <clears throat> they're querying him about his family his response is who are my family who are my family when we read Luke 17 he was telling us if your brother trespass rebuke him do you understand if they repent forgive them and he said, clearly, categorically in verse 50, it's unequivocal. We can't mistake it. Whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. The righteous understand who their family truly is. This is very important. The righteous acknowledge their brothers in Christ and they have a desire to fulfill God's will. As a righteous individual, 
we are fully aware. I say fully aware. Maybe that's a stretch. We have an awareness. We have an awareness that we are members of God's family. And that those we see, and I, I, this is really important, all right? Luke 17 is telling us, you may have brethren who are struggling. That's what 17 is really presenting. A struggling brethren. And Jesus is so good. This is what he says. He says, verse 4 says in Luke 17, and if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, seven times in a day. Listen, some, <laughs> let me begin by saying, some people today walking around professed Christians are condemning people to hell for that. You know that? They are, listen, I know when I was in a position where uh, maybe it wasn't seven times a day that I can remember, but two, three times a day, I was contravening what I should not have been. And I was seeking the Lord for forgiveness. And if I had gone to the wrong brother or sister at that point in time, they could have condemned me to hell. I might not be here talking to you guys right now. Compassion, grace. The righteous understand that grace is to be extended to our family. The righteous understand who their family is. People of God, we're on page 17 of my notes of 27. Let me pray because if I go forward from here... <laughs> I don't know when we're going to stop. It is very key. I, and I know we've spent a few, I know we've spent a few episodes talking about this. But what I really want us to understand is that, you know, righteousness is the way of God. Righteousness is the way of God. And we have been called. When we go into it next week, I'll, I'll open it up and share with you some of this. But we've been called to live out his standard. It's there in the scriptures. And the master was constantly painting this picture for us. Paint, like, it's so powerful how while he was here, he was a model and he was a support. While he's gone, he's still a model and a support. It's such a beautiful picture to see. <laughs> we should not give up. We should not be wary. We must go on. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Glorious Father, we worship you. Father, again, I thank you for your holy word and your holy scriptures. You and you alone are to be glorified. You saw us, Father, knew us before the foundations of this world, before we were a twinkle in our papa's eye, before we were formed in our mother's womb. Father, we thank you. Thank you for a day like this that we can share your word and be encouraged, be edified, be educated in your truth, your kingdom, your purpose. Father, I ask you that the seed that's been sown today of your word, the seed of your word, the good seed, will be sown into good ground of our heart. And that we will germinate, Lord God, Father. We will bear fruit, Lord, that you might prune, that we might bear fruit again. Father, have your way. Help us, Lord, that we might, we might, Manifest, Lord, the 30, 60, and 100 fold return on your word in this season, Lord, for those who need to see the fruits, who need, Lord God, Father, your power. Have your way, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>